Well, good afternoon and, and welcome everyone. My name is Barry Rave. I'm a professor here at the Ford School and I'm the director of Close Up, the Center for Local, State, and Urban Policy, which was one of the co-sponsors of today's event. I want to begin by thanking my colleague Bonnie Roberts for all of her hard work as always in organizing this event. And I also want to acknowledge our co-sponsors, Poverty Solutions, where we recognize the very exciting things that are going on under Luke Schaefer's leadership and the opportunity to work more and more in collaborative ways. I want to thank Luke, the Director of Poverty Solutions, and our Ford School students, Amara Ansari and Ryan Ruggiero, Ruggiero excuse me, uh, who will sort through questions that you can submit via note cards um, to our speaker after his talk. We've reserved about 25 minutes at the end of the session for Q&A. We want to have good discussion after what I'm sure will be a very interesting presentation. So please write any questions that you have on three by, three by five cards. And staff will begin picking those up um, in about half an hour. So just be mindful of, of all of that. Um, you know, we do a number of events here at Ford. And Close Up has done a fair number over the years as well. For a long time, I've really wanted to find some way to focus a bit on the unique governance circumstances of our nation's capital, Washington, D.C. Not quite a city, not quite a state, but with interesting, interesting policy issues and questions. And I've often wanted for us to find as a center ways to engage the topics related to the earned income tax credit, particularly sub-federal variations and versions of it an issue that has become even more ripe for conversation in this state since Governor Whitmer proposed substantial changes to the Michigan EITC through what's probably better known proposals to elevate the Michigan gasoline tax to the highest rate in the U.S. Lots of reasons to think about talking about these two issues, EITC at the subfederal level, but also a Washington, D.C. context. I've wanted to do these things for a long time. I've also, for at least a few years, wanted to try to figure out some way to get Bradley Hardy here to give a talk. So you can argue today as a triple crown or a triple threat because, Bradley, we are delighted to have you join us. Uh, Bradley is an associate professor in the School of Public Affairs at American University. He is currently a visiting scholar at, the Russell, Russell, at Russell Sage in Washington, D.C. He is also a non-resident uh, senior fellow in the Economic Studies program at the Brookings Institution. And many of you know his work. Uh, he is making a real impact across a number of areas of social poverty policy considerations and was just a natural person for both poverty solutions and close up to come together in this event. Uh, on a more personal note, I actually got to meet Bradley for the first time three years ago when I shared an office, a courtesy office I had during a sabbatical at American University down the hall. And I realized what an engaging, thoughtful scholar he is in every sense of that term, and just a very positive and constructive presence. And so I am just absolutely delighted and honored to be able to welcome and introduce Bradley Hardy. Bradley, welcome. Okay. Yeah. That's uh, very nice. Yeah. OK, well, uh, Barry, uh, thank you for that introduction. and. Uh, Thanks to Close Up and Poverty Solutions for, for hosting me um, and, and happy to kind of talk about this, this project that I have that's joint with Dan Muhammad and, and Marcus Casey and a former student, Rucha Samudra. Um, you know, my work has broadly been thinking about the social safety net. I know a lot of folks here at, at Ford uh, go to class and you're talking about these issues here as well. Uh, social safety net, but then even thinking about social mobility. Uh, what policy um, you know, interventions do we have? And DC has been interesting because, you know, as it turns out, they've been quite aggressive on these sorts of policy interventions uh, like EITC, uh, but not limited to EITC, um, uh, some other interventions as well. Here we're focused on the earned income tax credit. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'll give some overview. I think it's an interesting thing because depending on the classes you're taking or your area of scholarship, you might know a lot or a little about the program. So hopefully we'll, we'll bring everybody up to speed um, throughout the talk. Okay, and so you know the, the work uh, relies on administrative tax data in the city. So um, we're grateful to the government of uh, District of Columbia, as well as Upjohn Institute and Russell Sage for supporting the work. And um, this is kind of boilerplate that 
you know, I'm going to be prescriptive in here, um, talk about income inequality, talk about a lot of the trends we're seeing, but, um, you know, ne neither I nor my colleagues are speaking for the, the government or, or, or Mayor Bowser, who, who just released her 2020 budget uh, in, in D.C. And a lot of interesting issues there related to uh, homelessness and, and affordable housing policies. So interesting stuff going on in the city. Okay, so uh, at the federal level, if you're a student of kind of poverty policy, social welfare policy, you know, you'd find that the, the federal EITC, uh, it's been around for a while, uh, but it's undergone sort of substantial expansions throughout the 80s and 90s and even 2000s, typically during tax reform uh, efforts. Uh, that's the federal level. The, the, the city enacted its own EITC in, in 2001, but it was only 10% of whatever federal credit uh, a worker would receive. Um, but it's ratcheted up over the 2000s uh, to equal 40% of whatever federal earned income tax credit uh, that the filer receives uh, today. Um, by our estimation, it, it makes it uh, the, the most generous uh, subnational credit. Um, there are some other states that have something akin to 40% uh, on the docket, but it comes with a bunch of uh, provisions that DC doesn't have. Um, we'll talk a bit more about this um, in, in, a, in a couple of slides, but really you can think of the earned income tax credit as a wage subsidy that's just operating through the tax code. And so this is really making work pay a bit more, uh, creating positive incentives for folks uh, to work in the first place. And there's been a whole battery of labor economics and social policy research more or less showing that um, this subsidy, this, this tax credit, um, does in fact incentivize work. It, it, it boosts consumption. Um, it, it does have uh, quite a bit of benefit. Um, and then interestingly, you know, when you talk to people about what they think welfare is, even to this day, it's quite fascinating, 2019, and there are images um, that many citizens have of, of a very generous cash welfare state. Uh, and by and large, with, with maybe some, some state exceptions where there's more generosity, that hasn't been the case since about the mid to late 1990s. Um, uh, standard welfare or TANF goes to a, a bunch of important at times, but non-cash uh, activities, maybe uh, you know, job assistance, job training, uh, even some child, sub child care subsidies, uh, transportation subsidies. But other states are doing a lot of work in, in welfare on uh, marriage promotion. Um, but oftentimes not putting money into the cash benefit. Interestingly then, the earned income tax credit is actually the largest cash transfer that's going to go uh, to the poor in, in America. So kind of a not well-known fact. And you know, they talk about burying the lead. Uh, one thing I would say, though, is that um, the one policy challenge, and folks at board would grapple with this, is that you only get this if you're working in the first place. So you can kind of imagine that there's a lot of benefits, there's a lot of buy-in to this program politically. Um, you know, a lot of different reasons people have, have tended to support the federal EITC. Uh, but nonetheless, this is part of a general result that we see um, more and more sort of general welfare benefits going to folks who are maybe poor and near poor. Uh, and, and in many instances, fewer benefits going to folks who are in deep poverty. Uh, and so there's folks like, like Luke who've done a lot of this interesting work thinking about folks who are well below the, the federal poverty line, right? Um, so that's, a, that's an interesting uh, fact to kind of carry with you as we, we move forward. Um, we want to understand whether or not the, uh, the, the city-state intervention uh, combined to um, lower inequality with the federal EITC. So you've got this DC earned income tax credit, you've got the federal EITC that's being received concurrently, does it reduce inequality? And then we also wanted to understand if we, we saw any evidence of increased earnings and incomes. Um, I'm gonna focus the limited time we have here, um, really thinking through the, the inequality results we have, and then kind of in closing, I'm gonna tell you about sort of what we're thinking about in terms of income growth over the, over the 2000s. Um, 
Many of you in this room will use secondary data sets like uh, the current population survey, uh, uh, Michigan's panel study of income dynamics. Uh, here we're using actual tax return data uh, for tax filers in the District of Columbia. And so this has you know, a bunch of uh, interesting opportunities, but also some limitations. And, and so, you know, we do find pretty substantial post EITC reduction in inequality. It's a good news. Um, but we also see some interesting evidence that the, the well-documented transitions economically within DC are also showing up in this data. So for those of you who aren't really familiar with the context of the District of Columbia, we've experienced like rapid gentrification, rapid neighborhood change, neighborhood transition. And it's really kind of a, a, a tale of, uh, of two sides insofar as this has put quite a bit of strain on low and moderate income residents. And I'll show you a little bit of what this looks like in terms of the composition of the city at the end of the talk. But then on the other hand, uh, the improved property tax base, improved income tax base, this actually allows the city to be able to finance, uh, you know, in our, our view, uh, the most generous uh, subnational credit. Um, so uh, both things are happening here. So it's interesting, you know, I've taken a side. Now it's interesting, you know, for me, talking about tax policy is like, you know, it's like really exhilarating, right? Uh, I love it. I don't know how you all feel, but you know, I woke up this morning, I was a little sluggish, and you know, I, you know, I was out dinner with Barry last night, and this is not to do with taxes here. Um, I said, boy, you know, Barry, I'm, I'm starting to feel kind of allergic reaction. I get allergies and swelling and stuff like that. I was trying to figure out, you know, what was going on. And, you know, I woke up this morning and I figured it out. My granddad, my mom, and my dad have PhDs from Michigan State. <laughs> I got Sparty running through my, I'm, I'm allergic. I didn't even know. I, I, you know, so I bear with me. You know, uh, exactly. I was going to say, do people, do people lead with that or end with that? <laughs> that's right. Uh, I'm from North Carolina, so that's a whole other issue. But um, okay, so moving forward, now you're, you're, you're awake now. So um, if you go into the background on EITC in the 70s, there was this larger conversation about um, tax burdens on low-income workers, there were also proposals percolating around um, things that look a lot like universal basic income, uh, negative income tax experiments. And so the EITC in some sense was born out of these conversations that sort of said, well, you know, at a minimum we could, we could really try to reduce um, this large implicit tax on, on, on earnings and work uh, as people are cycling off of welfare and then hitting um, you know, tax burdens that we want to we want to nullify that and get rid of that as a as a disincentive to work, um, and so then there's been this big literature at the federal level, more or less documenting that, you know, when you use the earned income tax credit as more or less a proxy for an income shock, so as a clever identification strategy to kind of ask a bigger question about the role of income in, in driving educational outcomes, things like this, we see the EITC does in fact promote. Um, higher educational outcomes. Uh, we see positive effects on what we'd call extensive margin employment. So, you know, right now in this country, we have relatively low un unemployment rates. There's still a lingering conversation about what people would call the labor participation rate. So you got folks who just aren't even looking in the first place. That's of concern to policymakers um, with a particular attention to men uh, in many parts of the country. How do you get people to then enter in the first place? EITC has generally been found to be effective at that so-called extensive margin, right? Um, so we know a lot at the federal level. And there have been great um, think tanks to think hard about uh, what's going on in terms of poverty reduction. Colleagues at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, they'll do a lot of these like accounting exercises, you know, count before and after EITC, how many people are lifted above poverty. Um, but we don't know as much at the subnational level. Um, again, as I said at the outset, you've got quite a bit going on, uh, which I'll try to summarize. Uh, but 
we've seen the federal credit have big expansions. Tax Reform Act of 1986 had a big expansion. We had another big expansion more recently in the, uh, the Recovery Act uh, during the Great Recession. Um, but then concurrent with this, you've had the DC credit enacted around 2000, 2001, and then have these kind of credit expansions throughout the 2000s. So I'll show you this in a table, but they started off at 10% of the federal. Um, you move up to 25% of the federal in 2002. Then you go to 35% of the federal credit in 06, and then finally 40% of the federal credit in 2009. And, and so a lot of what we're doing in our, our studies, because we've gotten some, some work done prior to this project and we have future ideas, is just to kind of understand how these expansions over the 2000s have related to issues like inequality, um, like mobility across the city, and, and really just trying to, to do an evaluation in a test case that might represent where some policymakers would want to go with a more generous credit uh, in their own states or, or even nationally. Okay, so what we're showing in the map here is that over half the states have now enacted uh, supplementary ITCs. Uh, now, the, the gold colored ones are, are not refundable, right? So, you know, Virginia, for example, they're just trying to offset any tax burden that you have. So the, the sorts of mechanisms and effects that you know, we're talking about from the federal EITC, you, know, you might surmise that you, you don't expect that uh, from something that's uh, non-refundable. Some local context, uh, you guys here in Michigan have an earned income credit that's equal to 6% of the federal EITC. Um, I was having a nice conversation this morning in close up uh, where it came to my attention that 6% is a relatively new and, and lower uh, level. Um, and that puts you all in interesting company because North Carolina, my home state, is to my knowledge the, the other state that actually had an EITC, but in the case of North Carolina, I think they removed it altogether. Um, and so that's just sort of an interesting context to think about uh, another piece of this context we're thinking about is that, at least in prior years, you, you might not know this, but you know this is impressive. Look at all these states that are doing this stuff on the ITC. Uh, California is doing some expansions as well. But it turns out that states can use their their welfare TANF block grants and particularly the maintenance of effort subcomponent uh, to fund the actual state EITCs themselves. Not all do it. Uh, Michigan was doing this uh, in, in previous years. Um, and so that's just sort of an interesting interplay to consider uh, as we think about earned income tax credits alongside other state level policies, TANF, minimum wages, uh, that, that in some instances, you know, we're actually drawing from parts of that, that, that grant, that block grant, uh, to, to support this, uh, this other uh, social policy intervention. Okay, so again, if you're someone who's in the weeds of like tax policy center tables and things like that, uh, then this is a familiar table. But the main thing I'd wanna call your attention to is the following. I, I told you that the, the EITC uh, incentivizes work. A and so really what's happening is that at the initial phase in or beginning point of the EITC, you can think about this as the going from no earnings to $1 earned, uh, if we looked at a, maybe a single parent with two kids, the way you read this is that 40 cents is subsidized on every dollar earned, right? So a dollar earned becomes a dollar 40. Uh, up to basically this minimum income just beyond $13,000, at which point this family finds themselves receiving the maximum EITC of about $5,500. And so, like any other social program, there's some interesting graphics. 
by uh, Gene Sterling and co-authors, they basically show that with our, our, our programs, um, these all have so-called benefit reduction rates. We phase out the program. Program doesn't go on indefinitely. What goes up must come down. And so the program phases out at around $18,000. Again, keep in mind, this is tax year 2014. You lose 21 cents of this benefit for every dollar earned. And you'd see this same sort of phase out in other social programs, um, you know, SNAP, food stamp benefits, for example, right? But then importantly, if we look at this last dollar amount, uh, an interesting point here is that for better or worse, this is a program that's hitting families that are uh, perhaps what we think of as uh, near poor, uh, moderate income, uh, but, but not strictly poor uh, in the classic sense, right? So, so this is kind of how the program's designed. Uh, I think I have an interesting little slide in the back. Um, uh, the classic stair-step figure for EITC. I'm not convinced that that's more or less um, helpful sometimes. Um, okay, so the policy context here is that you had really engaged nonprofit actors um, DC Fiscal Policy Institute, um, they are kind of a subset of the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. And the DCFPI was instrumental in pushing the DC Council and the mayor at the time, uh, Anthony Williams, to enact uh, a state EITC. And I think this context is important. You're at public administration and policy students. Uh, these things don't just happen. Uh, there's actual political pressure and, uh, put forth on policymakers. And so this is just what I was talking about before, that you, you see the credit expanding over the 2000s. Um, it is worth noting that we do now have a uh, childless EITC credit that's been around for a couple years that, that's also not been evaluated. Also worth noting that as we're talking about these DC level uh, changes throughout the 2000s, you know, you still do have the federal credit that's being adjusted upward for inflation, and you also have some expansions during the uh, Recovery Act, during the Great Recession, that, that made the credit a bit more generous for large, uh, large families, right? So I'm just showing you DC policy variation, but there's other stuff going on, uh, to be sure. Again, some subset of the room travels back and forth to DC quite a bit. I'll make the general conjecture that for people who visit DC, they're oftentimes spending time um, in the upper northwest part of the city. That's not the entire city, though. Uh, and there's a, a great rich history um, east of the river. Um, and east of the river, I would say, has greater heterogeneity and in income. Um, it, these are the wards seven and eight east of the Anacostia River. And by no stretch are those wards uh, uh, sort of dominated by poverty, but nonetheless, the highest poverty census tracts are situated in wards seven and eight. Uh, and so I'll show you some inequality results that more or less confirm that the inequality reduction has its largest impact uh, actually east of the river. Um, and some other stuff having to do with where the the composition of EITC filers uh, are seen to be shifting over the period. And I think largely it kind of follows what you might expect. Okay. So again, you know, if you put your secondary data hat on, um, you're, you're thinking about drawing data on the population of interest. Uh, in this area, we've thought hard about what would sort of be thought of as the modal poverty population. And this has traditionally been uh, families headed by one adult. Typically, that adult's a, a woman. Um, and so we follow in the tradition of this literature to think hard about trying to isolate uh, these single parents. We also compare to, to married families or married pam, uh, parents. Again, it's a bit in the weeds, but for our purposes, it's not a secondary data set. So we're taking tax definitions and trying to kind of bring them in uh, to what we would think of in the secondary data world. So folks who are filing as household heads are, are typically these single parents, and we're going to refer to them as such uh, in our results. 
And then we're going to look at people who are married filing jointly. Um, two additional considerations that the research team uh, continues to grapple with uh, are that we, we're thinking about this as, um, on the one hand, looking at families that stay in the city all 14 years. And then we have another version of this data where we allow for people to be in and out of the sample over that time period. Um, part of the thinking on this is that uh, there's a whole literature that's worried about welfare migration um, more generally. So if I'm really generous in the District of Columbia and you live in Virginia, maybe you'd move to DC uh, to take advantage of the more generous social policy regime. Uh, my reading of that literature is that there's, there's very weak evidence that that's an actual problem. Um, Policymakers who I've interacted with have more so voiced concerns about city level policies, maybe including um, DC's emergency shelter uh, law. Basically, particularly during cold, cold weather days, uh, if you are not housed, if you're homeless, you are guaranteed some, some housing benefit or provision. Uh, again, I don't know that there's actually evidence that there's serious welfare migration there, but, but nonetheless, in response to this, on the one hand, we, we try to think about people who are in the sample all 14 years, uh, but there's concerns that this is kind of overly restrictive, right? Um, these are kind of things that you think about when you're doing this sort of research. Okay. So a couple things to kind of call your attention to here. Um, like I just mentioned, this balanced versus unbalanced data, they really are different samples. Um, and importantly, if we call attention to the first two columns, um, the first point to make is that you think about mean income and earnings that you would see at the national level. Uh, at the mean and median, uh, DC looks quite a bit better. Um, you can see that in the mean statistics for adjusted gross income or earnings, uh, you got very high earners, um, and you could you could start to tell stories about kind of the lawyer lobbyist class in, in DC uh, that, that are driving up that mean relative to what you would see in a, in a, in a typical uh, metropolitan area, right? Um, it doesn't look as distorted at the median. Uh, but, but nonetheless, um, you know, we, we see that there's pretty stark differences here. Um, if we look at these sample statistics for so-called single parent households, either again the, the head of household filers, um, comparing across groups, you know, the first thing you see is that, well, you know, in general, most filers aren't receiving much, if any, EITC. But when we restrict to this kind of sample group of interest, we start to see that, you know, on average, uh, federal and, and, and city level EITC receive does start to jump up a bit, um, as we would expect, right? Uh, but the main takeaway here is that we're talking about a pretty advantaged sample overall, but amid a city where we've typically had steady state poverty of about 20%. So there is a, quite a bit of income inequality uh, in the city. Um, pockets of poverty east of the river, uh, a large uh, worker base that does uh, perform services in the service economy, uh, food service economy, so on and so forth. Married households uh, really don't uh, have nearly as much uh, meaningful EITC uh, credit levels. Um, they do participate, but um, the, the levels tend to be far, far lower. And, and so this is just a sample where, if anything, um, you know, I know it's a bunch of numbers, but that's pretty big for, for a city, right? Over $200,000. Uh, whether you're looking unbalanced or, or balanced. Uh, so that's the quite a fluent part of our sample in, in general. We also show the sample statistics for uh, tax filing units that are below the, the middle of the earnings distribution. And, and we think of this as an important group to isolate, mainly because when we're thinking about some inequality reduction, and I'm going to show you some, basically some rank, rank changes along the distribution uh, later on, you'd be worried that if you're just looking at 
overall inequality reduction, say uh, the difference in incomes and earnings between the 90th, the top of the earnings or income distribution, versus the 10th, that even with a really generous social policy intervention, I mean, you know, I, I'm showing you these, these statistics for AGI and earnings. You're, you're not going to move, you're not going to move the needle that much on the 90-10, right? So, thinking about how we maybe compare um, the relative performance of EITC recipients uh, as compared to the middle of the earnings distribution. Um, and again, you can see that the middle, uh, in, in my own view, starts to look a bit more like uh, America, frankly, um, you know, at, with respect to AGI, adjusted gross income, uh, and earnings. <laughs> Okay, so first off, one of the things we find just looking over the period is that uh, the EITC is providing something on the order of five to $6,000 of benefits if we kind of pool all the recipients together. Uh, and you know, thinking about what this means as a, as a subset of overall earnings, it's, it's quite substantial. And, and if you kind of call some attention to this orange bar running through, a, as you see it getting a bit thicker, uh, you know, this is kind of concurring with uh, the federal uh, credit moving up a bit, but also importantly, those city level expansions that I was talking about earlier, those are occurring in the data as well. Um, A similar snapshot if we focus on, again, single parents. I'm using the head of household tax definition here. You get two conclusions here, like I kind of showed you before, that largely the impacted uh, tax unit are these head of household single parent uh, filing units. You know, there's something else I want to mention while I'm on this slide, uh, and it'll, it'll come up a bit later, I think, but while I'm thinking about it, the, the tax data allow us to leverage a lot of interesting information, including across the city. Um, we do know from the American Community Survey, Current Population Survey, um, that the, the modal EITC recipient uh, is a black woman with children who's working. Uh, this is consistent with the demographics of D.C. D.C. just stopped being majority black uh, maybe within the last year or two. Um, it's still the largest racial group within the city. Uh, but one of the challenges with this uh, research endeavor using the tax data is that, you know, on the one hand, we have quite a bit of confidence in the earnings and incomes that people are, are reporting. But then on the other hand, we, we don't have uh, interesting demographics. Um, and so in a lot of my work, I'm using uh, the secondary data sets, and oftentimes I prefer those because, you know, I care about the demographics. I care about maybe the reported educational attainment of the individuals and families, um, you know, care about a whole range of other issues and uh, self-reported characteristics that the family might uh, bring to the surveyor. And, and that's, um, that's not contained in this data. So there's things that we can do that are nice, uh, but there are limitations, and so, um, you know, the research team, we view this as, you know, we're one piece of the puzzle, kind of trying to triangulate around what's going on in D.C. We can't do it with one data set, though, uh, so this is just one piece of the puzzle. Uh, here, we're following a, uh, a method uh, that uh, Pat Baer and Kerwin Charles uh, implemented in looking at uh, basically cross-race uh, uh, earnings inequality. And basically here what we want to do is think about uh, EITC recipients and put them in the bins with respect to people who are receiving uh, anywhere from the smallest to the largest EITC credits. And we want to understand uh, whether and how that EITC credit move them, moves them up the rank. Uh, if we were to list people from lowest earner uh, to highest earner, right? And so in this exercise, um, we're doing it for our two data sets of interest, the balanced and the unbalanced. And as I was saying before, these really are different samples. Uh, and so in this case, what I'd like to call your attention to is that 
uh, for the largest DITC credit, uh, on average, you're moving people three percentile points in the balanced panel. These are folks who are forced to live in the city in our data uh, kind of criteria in 14 out of 14 years. And then in the unbalanced panel, we're actually moving them five percentile points. Um, and, and so, you know, this is non-trivial, and yet at the same time, uh, as I mentioned before, we might still think that that's not quite the right uh, distribution to think about in terms of whether and how the, the EITC is moving people up that earnings rank. And so when we just cut that sample off to be an at or below 50% of the earnings distribution, um, when we really focus attention on folks who are receiving the largest EITCs, uh, we see anywhere from a five percentile point move to 11 percentile point move uh, up the earnings distribution. And so again, part of what we're trying to get a feel for in this exercise is just the different ways in which the EITC is having this uh, inequality reduction, right? And so clearly what's happening here then is that you have people who are receiving generous EITCs who are then moving a bit above people who are just outside of qualifying for the credit, right? Um, and all the while, as you're listening to me present this, it's worthwhile considering that unlike, say, a monthly cash benefit or monthly SNAP benefit, I haven't done my taxes yet, actually. You get it at tax time. And you might get a little bit before tax time if you use a tax preparation service, uh, but this is lumpy. And so if you're thinking about consumption smoothing, thinking about sort of broader sort of well-being implications, uh, even as I'm, I'm showing you some, I think, uh, you know, important inequality reductions, it, it's not necessarily clear if we prefer the lumpy to the smooth. Um, there's been some interesting qualitative research that's documented the fact that in many instances, families love receiving the credit as a lump sum, and that it feels like precautionary savings. It's an opportunity to, frankly, feel like you did save, pay down some important expenses. Um, so there's been a lot of good work in this area, kind of thinking about whether it's actually better to think about this um, in some sort of smoothed out context. Maybe we'll talk about that a bit more in the, in the Q&A. Um, okay, so I'm gonna show you now what are more like sort of standard inequality uh, trend figures. A lot of people would put up a, uh, the Gini coefficient or a tile. Uh, you know, this is a bit more transparent, just comparing uh, earnings at the 50th uh, uh, middle of the income di earnings distribution relative to the 10th percentile of the earnings distribution doing the 50th percentile of the earnings distribution relative to the 25th. And so if we call attention to the, to the blue trend, the top one, comparing blue to orange is just thinking about this 50-10 ratio before accounting for the DC and federal EITC and then after. So like this is doing what you expect it to do. There's an inequality reduction. It might be a bit subtle from the seats, but the inequality reduction um, starts off and holds at around 15%, but then that, that gap closes to more like 12% by the end of the period. Uh, and then importantly, you see some evidence uh, of some overall trend increase in inequality occurring. Note too that the reduction from 50 to 25 pre and post EITC is you know, pretty trivial, yeah, about 2%. But where we've begun to push, and I think we're gonna do more interesting work, is to kind of think about what's going on within the city. And I think there's a lot of work that is now acknowledging, whether it's uh, the Opportunity Insights Group, they're not the first, just acknowledging <laughs> substantial heterogeneity or, or sort of diversity within an area. You know, it's very, knee jerk sometimes to talk about, you know, the North versus the South or, you know, uh, Durham, North Carolina versus Fayetteville where Fort Bragg is. But, you know, actually some of the interesting variation is within Durham County, 
uh, pockets of poverty near downtown, not far from Duke University. Um, parts of suburban Durham that are, that are quite affluent and have uh, residents who work in the Research Triangle Park. Um, these differences matter. In DC, they matter. Uh, we see uh, inequality reduction from the earned income credit in what is really the more affluent part of DC, the, the west part, uh, and also pool some parts of northeast DC. Uh, but we still see the, the overall trend increase in inequality. When we compare to those wards seven and eight that I highlighted at the outset, a couple things jump out. First of all, uh, in this pretty transparent measure of inequality, you learn that one, inequality is just lower overall in these poor, relatively poorer, or you know, moderate income parts uh, of the city. The post-tax or post-DITC inequality reduction is also larger in sort of absolute uh, percentage terms as well. That's both the case for the 5010 and the 5025. So, you know, in a sense, I told you that this was a big uh, refundable tax credit. Um, in, in some respects, this is doing what you might expect it to do. Now, again, another piece running in the background is that, you know, I described Ward 7 and 8 as poorer. Uh, on the other hand, Ward 7 and 8 is likely to be where many of us in this room could afford a house, uh, maybe, if we were to try to move to D.C. right now. So you've got a lot of economic transition occurring uh, in that side of the city. Um, and you've got to be careful painting with too wide of a brush. But nonetheless, there are, are certainly census tracts that have relatively deep and persistent uh, poverty. OK. So you know, I, I want to close out with uh, two additional figures here. Um, there was a report that came out uh, just today in the Washington Post, uh, more or less saying what I think a lot of us social scientists have known, which is that DC's experienced quite a bit of neighborhood transition. Um, and in fact, it's just heightened over the last couple of years. Uh, Co-author Dan Muhammad uh, put together this really interesting graphic. And the main point to make is that at the outset of the earned income tax credit in 2001, you still saw quite a bit of EITC use in wards seven and eight. This is a bit subtle here, but if you look at by the end of the period, what you'll notice is that even more EITC use has moved uh, east of the river. And so again, this is kind of consistent with what you would think, which is that if people do want to stay in DC, uh, they are moving to the relatively more affordable side of the city. This also has all sorts of interesting implications about um, sort of geographic uh, access to jobs. Uh, when most of you visit DC, uh, you will stay in hotels and eat in restaurants that are more likely to be in the west, uh, maybe northeastern part of the city. Uh, so a lot of the job opportunities are going to be across town as well. So we see this shifting uh, of low and moderate incomes. Um, the last thing I'll show you is that the likelihood of actually receiving the EITC has dropped from almost 20% uh, likelihood to just over maybe 12%. So again, this is sort of evidence that in the overall sample, a lower and lower proportion of the filing universe are even qualifying for this in the first place. And so this is also some descriptive evidence. Uh, again, uh, it doesn't paint the whole picture. But it's certainly consistent with the notion that just the overall composition of the city is changing quite a bit, and it's something to keep an eye on. This is actually an interesting one that the team kind of wants to push a bit further on. OK, so we talked about inequality and the role of the larger EITC as a result of DC supplement. Um, this is just inside of $9,000 at the max uh, back in 2014. And I showed you that we did see some post-CITC inequality reduction. Um, but nonetheless, it's rising throughout the city overall. Uh, in terms of some future work that we're thinking about, uh, you know, at the outset, I kind of described for you that we really had these two stark choices that we made uh, for folks who were concerned about welfare migration. We made this decision to restrict uh, the sample to people who were in 14 out of 14 years. 
Um, on the one hand, that might also be a bit too restrictive. So we also have some samples where we basically don't impose that mobility restriction. Um, so we're thinking about something in the middle. And I was actually talking to, with Luke about this. Uh, maybe it's five years, maybe it's six years in sample. Uh, but we're playing with these, um, uh, these sorts of uh, decisions. Uh, the other piece is that, you know, we've got a series of regression models um, that we've been working with um, for months and months now. Uh, but we've really been thinking about hard, sort of, you know, what do we think we're picking up? Uh, particularly given the last slide that I showed you, where the composition of the city itself is actually just shifting quite a bit. And so, you know, uh, the team, we've been talking about some other approaches, maybe like simulated instruments. And that's just sort of a fancy way of saying, if we could sort of take a snapshot of tax filers and residents at the beginning of the period, and then more or less simulate um, what we think they would look like in 2014 after receiving uh, these benefits, that might be an interesting way to kind of think harder about uh, what this sort of policy is doing with respect to income growth. Um, so that's kind of aside from the inequality stuff I showed you. Um, and, and then finally, we just want to continue to push this sort of neighborhood context you know, that I'm telling you about in these, these maps. And so not just thinking about inequality, but uh, differences in crime, interactions with uh, TANF policy and minimum wages. DC is also going to a $15 minimum wage by 2020, 2021. Uh, so I've got some separate work uh, looking at that. Uh, interestingly, in some of our forecasting models, we do show that the EITC, along with uh, minimum wages, is a net, net benefit. You might reduce the EITC a little bit. Uh, but on balance, those workers uh, tend to be better off overall. Uh, so, you know, again, we're trying to push in these directions. Um, last slide. And um, just to kind of consider that, you know, we do see inequality reduction here. Um, I'm a little more circumspect about the increase in income. Uh, and I didn't even really talk much about uh, those models. I didn't show those. A bit more circumspect there. Um, but I think it's worth considering that, you know, the EITC is quite popular uh, sort of on a relatively bipartisan basis. If I'm going to generalize, uh, many liberals or progressives like it because it's sort of a wage supplement, wage subsidy. Uh, many conservatives tend to like it because it, it promotes work and only goes to people who are working in the first place, uh, ostensibly. Um, but how do you compete with um, cities where there's really pronounced uh, cost of, of living issues, right? Um, and in that sense, for a subset of the population that's not really receiving much in the way of historical earnings growth, like, you know, Ford grads are going to go out and on average, you're going to see a, a rising earnings profile. Um, but a lot of folks who are operating kind of at the, the lower earnings end of the, of the labor market, important work, but work that's not paying as much, um, these sorts of uh, supports like EITC look increasingly permanent, which is kind of a permanent part of the package uh, that people have. Uh, and, and then again, just a reminder that this is a pretty generous benefit that you have no access to if you're not working in the first place. So um, it's a qualified yes in terms of inequality reduction, uh, but in our view with quite a few caveats. So uh, that's the project. Um, it's it's multi-year. There's a bunch of different things we're trying to do. So um, you know, the questions and suggestions are, are not only helpful, but they would, they would enter into the sorts of things we want to improve upon. So thanks. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for coming and speaking to us today. And thank you to Close Up and Poverty Solutions for hosting this event. Um, my name is Amara, and I'm a graduating master's in public policy student here yeah. at the University of Michigan. And we've got some really interesting questions from the audience, so okay. I think we're going to move on to Q&A. Okay. So the first question that the audience has posed to you is if you have any data on how many tax filers who would actually be qualified for the EITC but end up not taking advantage of it. Yep. That's a good question. So... I do not have that number for the District of Columbia, but nationally there's been some good work. I want to say Maggie Jones 
Yeah, so Maggie Jones has this work. I'm looking at uh, Kathy Micklemore, who does a lot of EITC work also, among others. Uh, but I think it's around 80% that, that actually are participating. Um, and that's at the national level. And if you think of the EITC as a social program, and that could be your own sort of argument, it's administered through the tax system, but 80% looks you know, quite good relative to other, other welfare programs. Hi, my name is Ryan Ruggiero. I'm a first year master public policy student. Uh, next question. There's evidence of a lot of low income workers in Michigan that they don't know they're eligible for the state's EITC. Yep. Would there be any way to use the nudge movement to have these people default into claiming the EITC? That's interesting. So, you know, again, this is, I'm going to answer kind of like the question I wish I was asked here, right? So. I think there's a lot of people who would wonder about a regime where we had a tax system that really kind of automatically took care of this for people. So, you know, just in general, like you think about being automated into savings, um, a tax system where you, you weren't really having to go in and make that, that filing choice. I would say that for Michigan and the other states, there are interesting questions about nonprofit outreach. So many of you are going to go to work in nonprofits. Uh, many of the nonprofits in DC uh, engage in very aggressive outreach, billboards on buses, so on and so forth, free tax preparation. Uh, that, that moves the needle quite a bit on uh, getting people to know that they, they qualify for this benefit. Um, another issue, uh, which again, it's, it's kind of a splashy topic right now, but to the degree that you have people who are engaged in, um, it's not 1099 work necessarily, but it's, it's contract work or whatever the form on the, you know, contract work, gig economy work, um, that is growing. I think it's easy to overstate the degree to which that's a factor, but you do have this complexity where, you know, on the one hand, if you have your, your big box employer who's sending you the forms, they might even have folks who are letting you know that you qualify for the EITC. If you're on your own, uh, you may or may not know this, be aware of it. So I think that's also kind of a running issue. Um, those are the sorts of things you'd want to confront uh, to get participation up. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah. The next question. Um, at 6%, Michigan's EITC is very small. Yep when compared with DC's 40%, yeah. is there a low point cutoff where an ET, EITC policy just isn't even worth it? Or are there other benefits to having an EITC policy even if it falls at a lower rate? So my own view, I mean, I think opinions would vary here, but my own view is that, I mean, if the EITC is offsetting tax liability for, for low and moderate wage workers, that still seems like sensible public policy. And if you have that architecture in place, I mean, I'm a fan of the, the policy. So if you have that architecture in place, then it can be ratcheted up over time, right? So, you know, my own view is that, look, there's a political economy process that we're operating within. And you guys were, what, 20% at one point? So, you know, six is less than 20, but I think it still, it still matters. Um, I do think that it starts to raise an interesting question about uh, a program that's now defunct called Advanced EITC. So Advanced EITC was giving filers the option to receive the earned income credit more or less on a monthly basis. Uh, my sense is that it wasn't heavily hiked. There wasn't a lot of information about it. So there's quite a bit of low participation. I mean, I'm painting with a wide brush here, but um, it might raise the question about whether or not at sufficiently high or low levels, do some families then maybe prefer, figure, well, you know, this isn't that big of a bump at tax time. Maybe I do want to kind of smooth out on the order of, you know, 25 bucks a month or something like that. Maybe I'd rather have that. Uh, so I don't think six is too small to be meaningful. No, six is greater than zero. In your earlier map, some of the poorest states in the country, in Appalachia, West Virginia, Mississippi, for example, mm -hmm. uh, 
looked like they did not have the EITC um, credit at the state level. Do you know why that is? And as a follow-up, do you have any advice or best practices you would suggest to these states who would want to implement an EITC or states who would want to improve their credit? Yeah, so I don't know that I'll, I'll lend, well, thinking about how I want to say this. I mean, this is consistent with a, a range of social policies that in the labor market context kind of skew towards being a bit less generous. So this sort of a broader conversation about uh, you know, sort of unionization, uh, worker protections, uh, wage theft, minimum wages, EITC. And if you were, I'm pretty confident about this, if you were to kind of run that, that very parsimonious regression on where are the states that have higher minimum wages above the national average, uh, states that have supplemental EITCs, um, the South is going to come in as a negative there. So um, that's just kind of how it's been. I, I think that as far as guidance goes, I think that at the same time, you've got the EITC as being a relatively popular social policy intervention across um, the ideological spectrum. If you looked at Paul Ryan's big poverty recommendation plan from maybe two or so years ago, he speaks glowingly about EITC expansions. And so think what you will about the, the Ryan Opportunity Grants and, and that idea. Um, it does signal that among the things you might find some support for, um, an EITC could have some relative traction. I guess the other point to make, though, is that there's substantial heterogeneity within the Southeast. And so I mentioned here that Montgomery County, New York City, they have EITCs. Um, it's worth mentioning that there are cities that are trying to do minimum wages. There are probably cities within the South, Birmingham comes to mind, that tried to do this. They actually got shot down by the state legislature. I guess I mean to say that um, the tax base may or may not be designed for a city to do this, but I do think that there's substantial kind of diversity of thought within the Southeast, such that you, you probably do have quite a bit of support for this. It's just a matter of whether or not you can get that done through a, through a governor and a, a legislature. So you showed us earlier uh, a graph that depicted a decrease in inequality. Mm -hmm for those who earned more, earned more because of the EITC. What are your thoughts on how it has impacted affordability? And has there been, has the gap in affordability, especially when it comes to housing and food, uh, at all been reduced because of the EITC? So I think that in DC, we don't know. This is the kind of thing that, you know, the research team, we want to do more work on. A subset of the team did do a study on this back in 2016. We were specifically trying to understand whether the combined EITC, DC and federal, reduced uh, basically mobility out of a, a transitioning neighborhood. A, a secularly, people would refer to it as a gentrifying neighborhood. And we basically found that the answer was no. The credit doesn't seem to buffer uh, against uh, you know, low and moderate incomes moving out of these these neighborhoods that are getting more and more expensive. So, and I think this is consistent with the, the scale of price increases. Um, so many of the professoriate in Washington, D.C. don't actually live in Washington, D.C. And, uh, you know, housing benefits are not an entitlement. So just because you qualify for a voucher doesn't mean you get one. And there's big housing, affordable housing shortages in DC, uh, Mayor Bowser was just proposing to uh, ratchet up uh, money into the sort of the housing assistance fund from 100 million to 130 million. And while that sounds like a big number, um, what it translate to, translates to in terms of actual units, um, you know, there's more work to be done there. Yeah. It's good questions. Are undocumented workers eligible for EITC, and if so, how do they claim it? That 
That is a good question that I am actually not sure about. And so that's one of those that thank you to the audience or someone online. I'm going to go back and look into that one. Um, I mean, from the purposes of the tax office, they need a valid uh, tax ID or social. So it's, you know, you can't rule out in a sense that, that this is coming to folks, um, but, but I'm not sure. Yeah, it's a good question. DC recently eliminated its 60 month time limit for TANF recipients. Mm -hmm. How should the city prioritize efforts to expand safety net programs like TANF and the EITC, which may serve different populations? Sure. Well, I mean, I think in part, DC and the other states, let's, let's, let's pretend DC is a state right now. Uh, the DC and the other states are also constrained by federal TANF policy that hasn't done much to update the size of the actual block grant itself. Um, and so if you think about what these block grants look like in 1996 dollars, that they've really not uh, gone up uh, much, if at all. They haven't had, you know, we keep on pushing TANF reform uh, you know, down the road a bit further, right, and kicking the can. So you know, part of my response is that, you know, Part of DC's ability to do more for its residents through these programs is also tied to having a, you know, a, a TANF program that kind of allows for the resources there. Uh, that said, I, I like the fact that relative to other states, DC tends to, in, in my view, put quite a bit of the, the block grant into actual cash assistance. Uh, kind of a, again, I was alluding to this earlier, many states after 1996, maybe especially the late 90s, if you looked at the proportion of the block grant allocated to so-called basic assistance, that's actual cash, uh, many states went from allocating, say, 70 or 80 percent to basic to well under maybe 20, 15 percent. Uh, nice work by uh, Marianne Bittler and Hillary Hoynes looking at this in a Hamilton paper. So I guess what I'm saying is I think DC is doing relatively well um, on TANF. I think they're doing relatively well on EITC. Uh, my own opinion is that kind of the missing link here is housing. And, and so this isn't a paper about housing, but the, the questioner, questioner rightly notes that um, how do these things all work together? Uh, I think and there's four people here who would speak to this um, even more authoritatively. Um, in general, we're getting out of the business of um, running public housing in the U.S., uh, more voucher-based systems. Uh, many of the low, uh, low income and affordable housing interventions work with uh, you know, private developers. And so you get these deals where you had a, you had a, a plot of land where maybe 100 low income workers uh, had housing. And with the new development, Oftentimes, it'll be some, some subcomponent of that, maybe, maybe 30, maybe 50, right? So you worry about that sort of piece. So you know, if I had to wave a wand, I'd say um, big focus on affordable housing would, would be key. Single mothers experience meaningful costs associated with working, which, as we know, is a requirement for the mm -hmm. EITC, including transportation and especially child care costs, which are very high. Is the benefit of the EITC large enough to offset these costs? I don't think so. By the way, these are like really hard questions. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't think so, though. Um, I think that this is one of these examples where metaphorically, um, you know, Advil's a great medicine. Advil is not going to solve your broken ankle, though. And sometimes, like, metaphorically, meaning that we push something to do more than it's designed to do. Uh, again, TANF reform, we could do more on cash assistance. Housing right now is not an entitlement. Um, you could think about some interesting proposals. Uh, one from uh, Jim Ziliak at Kentucky, uh, also a Hamilton Project paper, where he proposes bumping up food stamp benefits, SNAP benefits, and he links it to higher transportation costs, that the, the food basket and calculations for how we design SNAP it's really thought of in a time period when more families, poor and non-poor, were going to do more and more food preparation at home. Uh, commuting times were probably a bit lower. I mean, stylized 
uh, kind of fact in DC, there's been some great kind of research and reporting uh, looking at you know, people who ride this popular bus line, uh, 16th Street. And these are kind of second and third shift workers. And they document how uh, folks are taking two and even three hours to get home in Maryland. Uh, so I think that the answer is no, the EITC, in my opinion, isn't enough. But there's other programs that could be beefed up uh, to maybe meet that need. Given that um, the EITC necessitates that the beneficiary work, it often leaves out people who often don't have the resources to find work mm -hmm. and by extension cannot receive EITC benefits. Are there ways that we can improve on EITC or rebrand it, reframe it, restructure it so that those who consistently look for employment opportunities but don't find them uh, can receive the help they need? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. And again, you all were here as witnesses. This is not a talk about TANF. But nonetheless, I do think this is another case where the cash welfare pro or the traditional welfare program, temporary assistance for needy families, that question to me really kind of maps into things that that program can do. So for example, what are the structures in place to allow for and provide for job training? Right now, it's something like Typically, 12 months uh, of education uh, can be counted as a work activity. And if you start to think about some of the certificates that people could sort of actionably get into to increase their work readiness for uh, you know, sort of a high quality job, some of them might take a bit more than 12 months. Uh, what type of safety net do we provide for job training? Right now, believe it or not, you don't have a lot of coordination in all states between what's called WIOA. Uh, within the Department of Labor. They provide sort of educational opportunities and job training for uh, disadvantaged workers, economic, economically disadvantaged workers. You don't have a lot of coordination with TANF in some states. And you know, I've argued this in a little policy brief from a few years ago. If you think about your own story, you or maybe some of the friends you had did benefit from uh, scholarships, maybe family and friends, who would even provide some safety net uh, while you were training and upgrading your skills. Maybe you have access to student loans. So I, I think that part of the question about how we get people who are not working into work involves bringing the bear, the TANF program, using that in innovative ways. Um, and there's also been some interesting work, um, including some stuff out of AEI, uh, where the policy prescriptions for TANF even include jobs of last resort. So, you know, there's been a lot of talk about federal job guarantees, among other kind of progressive policy interventions. This isn't that, but it does kind of get at the questioner's point that, you know, what do you do for people who maybe are discouraged, who are like trying to work, but they're having a hard time finding it? Um, so I think it's a great question. Thank you so much for all your responses today. Uh, we have one final question. Okay. Okay. What are possible drivers of increasing inequality starting in 2009 in the balanced panel? Mm -hmm. So I think this is something we don't know for sure. Uh, if you think about 2009 nationally, uh, you have kind of the core of the big economic recession uh, that was occurring in the country. And yet DC, um, due in part to federal stimulus, uh, really didn't experience the recession uh, in that way, uh, at least in the city. Uh, and in fact, you could maybe argue that there, was, there were more resources ramped up uh, in the city at that time period. Um, but I also think this is where a standard economic model kind of struggles to fully account for the fact that um, you had rapid development of uh, other amenities, uh, restaurants, housing. There's just been a broader secular move to the city. And that's not just DC, that's, um, that's all sorts of cities throughout the country. And, and so with that said, um, this sort of set into motion, uh, in my view, at least part of the inequality story. Um, and so, I think part of that is just a broader move back to cities. 
but I would also argue that uh, given our interest in the inequality trends, like this is something we actually want help with and want to understand better. So it's a great question. Yeah. Okay. Um, I want to just thank you again and note that um, we will be having one additional event this term through close up state and local renewable energy policy a symposium, a student led symposium on Monday, April 29th. Uh, there's more information on that in your bulletin. That said, uh, except for the Sparty reference, I really <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't help it. Thanks so for joining us on this illuminating issue, especially as this issue really picks up in Michigan in some very interesting ways. We'll oh. be in conversation as we go forward. Yeah. Bradley, thanks for being with us. Yeah, thank you all. Yeah, thank you. Yeah.